Hello, my name's Apollo, and today I'll be reading you stories from Once Below a Time, edited by Chelsea and Turner, published in 1988. This book came to be when students were given the task to go out and ask about strange events that people truly experienced, and then they came back and they put them all into this book. Story 1 is called Baba by Cheryl Francis. It was a gloomy day in September 1941, and no one in Clarence Town, Long Island was as sad as Laura was. She was 16 and unhappy because she had just found out that she was pregnant. She could not face her parents to tell them. Laura decided to run away, but she needed money. To get the money, Laura stole three of her Uncle Sam's sheep, sold them, and left for Abigail. Sam was an alert man who watched his farm closely. He noticed that the sheep were missing two days after Laura left. Late one evening, Sam sneaked away to the next settlement. He went to an old man so that the old man could fix whoever stole his sheep. The old man lived alone in a small thatch hut near the beach. He would chant, Ten, ten, the Bible, ten, every hour on the hour, to keep the evil spirits away. He had no clock, but he accurately repeated the ritual every day. Sam told the old man his request. The man urged Sam to wait until midnight when he could begin to work on the thief of the sheep. At midnight, the old man fidgeted with a worn-out deck of cards. He rubbed oil in the design of a cross on Sam's forehead. Then he told Sam to strap a white piece of linen on all the remaining sheep's neck and say the 23rd Psalm every night before he went to bed. After Sam heard the old man's instructions, he went home. By the time Laura was on the mailboat on the way to Abaco, the boat sailed near the western tip of Cat Island. Many people believed that the area close to Cat Island was filled with evil spirits, that these spirits acted when called upon. The old man and Sam had called on the spirits. Someone in the boat mentioned that they were passing Cat Island. Immediately, Laura felt a terrible pain in her stomach. She moaned and groaned. Minutes later, to the astonishment of everyone, she went, Ba, ba, like a sheep. This continued for hours until the boat had left the area of Cat Island. The experience was so strange that the captain decided to make an unscheduled stop at Eleuthera. There was a difference in Laura's behavior. She was as peaceful as a lamb. The next day on the boat was quiet. The only strange thing was that Laura had an enormous appetite. She craved cabbage and demolished a head of cabbage in minutes. Eventually, to the relief of the crew and passengers, the boat arrived in Abaco. Laura settled in Hopetown with some cousins. Seven months later, she gave birth to Melvina prematurely. Melvina was not only very tiny, but very unusual in other ways. It was impossible to get her to drink milk or juices. The only food that Melvina could eat was cabbage. Laura chewed the cabbage and gave it to Melvina. Melvina sucked on it with her tongue and swallowed it as an adult would, who had lost all their teeth. This super baby drew people from all around the Bahamas. No one could understand her makeup, not even the doctors. But people believed that Melvina was abnormal because her mother and father were closely related. When Melvina began to walk, she did so with her head downwards. Her body grew in a bending position instead of upright. She continued eating a cabbage diet for 12 years. On the night of Melvina's 13th birthday, Laura had a dream. She dreamt about her family in Long Island and that her Uncle Sam was dying. On his deathbed, Sam asked for his missing sheep. Then Laura remembered how she had sold the sheep. She recalled how she had behaved like a sheep on the boat. She could take no more of the dream. Laura woke violently. The first thing that came to her mind was Melvina's physical condition. She ran to the girls' room. There lay Melvina, fast asleep. Laura felt reassured and strengthened. On the following morning, Laura tried to get out of bed, but she felt an awesome pain from her neck to her hips. She could not straighten her back. After trying for two minutes, Laura managed to struggle out of bed. Melvina! Melvina! she called. Wake up! I have a pain in my back, and it looked like it bent over. Child, go call Dr. Enrev. There was neither sound nor movement from Melvina. She was dead. The humped back curse had passed from Melvina to her mother on the same night that Sam died.
Our next story is Hardhead Bird by Brandalee Conyers. Nicholstown Andrus in 1973 was a close-knit community. One half of the population was related to the other, and the business of one person was everyone's business. That summer I had recently turned eight. It was a local custom in Nicholstown for the younger children to go to the fields with the grown-ups and the older children during the summer vacation. I had to go to the fields with my grandfather and cousins. I was not needed to help harvest the crop, instead my grandfather gave me the responsibility of tending to my two younger cousins. The fields were located eight miles out of the settlement. They were cut up into sectors. This enabled the farmers to communicate among themselves. At lunchtime, everyone gathered on a plot of land set aside for having lunch. During this resting period, people socialized. They ate and gossiped with the latest news. There was a farmer whose name was Gus. His field was located to the left of my grandfather's field. Anyone standing in our field could easily see anything that happened in Gus's field. So could the other adjacent farmers. This was because of the closeness of the plots to each other. Gus had been obsessed with love for his wife Martha when she was alive. Most of the men in town laughed at Gus because of his obsession. Martha died giving birth to the couple's last daughter. Gus named his daughter Martha after her mother. When Gus's wife died, the obsession he felt passed to his daughter. Young Martha grew up very rude, selfish, and vain because of Gus's attention. He thought Martha could do no wrong. She was spoiled since her father never disciplined her. He allowed her to have her own way in any matter. Almost every other child over nine years old worked in the fields, all except for the invalids and Martha. Martha disliked working. Gus had 15 children. He needed Martha's help, but he did not force her to work. One particular day, all the farmers went to the fields earlier than usual. They had to pick peas as soon as possible, otherwise the sun would scorch the peas. That day I left my cousins with my great-grandmother. Grandfather needed me to help pick peas. Although everyone was extremely busy, Martha, as usual, sat in a cool spot beneath two pine trees. At one point I heard her laugh hysterically. From where I stood I could see her, but I could not see with whom or what she was laughing. Soon her father called from the far end of the field to ask what the joke was. She told him that an ugly bird kept flying around the pine trees. She was laughing at the bird. Everyone heard what Martha said. We all looked up to see the bird, but none of us saw it. By lunchtime we were talking about the way Martha had acted. My grand aunt told everyone she thought the spirit of Martha's mother had come to the girl. Martha, being the kind of person she was, had laughed. However, one woman went to Gus. She told him that the Chichanis were half men and half birds. If a person saw them and laughed, they would punish the person. The woman also pointed out something else. The Chichanis built their nests where the branches of two pine trees joined at the top. Martha had sat under two such trees. After Gus heard these things, he went to Martha. He forbade her to go near the trees because she knew her father would not punish her if she disobeyed him. Martha still wanted to sit below the trees. Towards the ending of the day, we packed our farming tools and were about to leave the fields to go home when all of a sudden we heard a scream coming from Gus's farm. The older people told us to wait where we were and went to investigate. Later, my grandfather told us what they found out. Martha had screamed. He said that when they found her beneath the pine trees, one of her knees was twisted away from her leg. There was a puncture in the middle of that knee. The puncture was filled with straw. The older people took Martha to the clinic. The nurse called for an emergency flight from Nassau and sent Martha on it to the hospital. To this day, Martha walks with a limp. When people ask her what happened that day in the fields, she always says that she doesn't know. The older folks still believe that as a result of her rudeness and disrespect to her father and the Chichani, Martha was punished. And as they say, hard-haired bird don't make good soup. Well, I hope you did enjoy those stories. Like I said, I really do appreciate what Telsine Turner was trying to do by putting these stories together. Though, like I also said, we've lost that tradition of storytelling. And I find that quite sad. The world can always use more stories. Stories are what bring culture 
what lets us know how the people of the past were thinking, what they were interested in. Speaking of stories, if you have any of your own, any urban legends from wherever you're from, please, I implore you to leave them in the comments. I would love to read them. I always find those interesting. While I can read more stories from this book once below a time, I recommend you find it for yourself. It's right there on Amazon. I'll leave a link in the description. But that's all from me. I look forward to seeing you guys again in the next video. But before you leave, make sure you hit that like, subscribe, and that share button. I truly do appreciate it. I'll see you guys in the next one. Peace.